don't waste your time trying to live someone else's life. You know, don't be trapped by dogma. Focus in on your own strengths, your own element, what you have to offer. Don't get lost in trying to become like someone else or mm -hmm. pretend to be someone else. There's a beautiful, one of my favorite quotes by Einstein and then Steve Jobs again. Einstein said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid. And too many of us are fish trying to climb a tree. Too many of us are monkeys being taught how to swim. Too many of us are lions being taught to live like cats. We're not getting to live in our element. So my second piece of advice is live in that element that you've naturally been given. Don't try to adopt another. You know, mm -hmm. we've all got a special genius inside of us. It was Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, this conversation. Steve Wozniak, look, Steve Wozniak, for those who don't know, is the tech guy behind Apple. He practically invented the technology and the mm -hmm. software and everything. So Steve Wozniak looked at Steve Jobs and he says, this is in Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Steve Wozniak, Wozniak looks at Steve Jobs and he says, what do you even do? He said, you're not a coder, you're not a designer, mm -hmm. you're not a marketer and you're not an engineer. What do you even do? Imagine challenging Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs replies, he says, he says, musicians play their instruments, I play the orchestra. That is the most deep understanding of one's role in life and not getting lost in other people's identities and perceptions of you. Steve Jobs knew that he wasn't a marketer, he wasn't an engineer, he wasn't a coder. So he hired all of those. But he played the orchestra, he brought it all together. And that's when you, when you find confidence in your own role, you won't be envious of anyone else. How many of you have a crazy dream or a crazy goal? I want you to write out in the comment section, what is your crazy dream? The dream that keeps you up at night is the real dream you should be chasing. But to chase that dream, to find that dream, to make that dream a reality, you need a strategy, right? A dream without a plan is just a wish. Tony Robbins said that, right? A dream without a plan is just a wish, right? Without a strategy, without a guiding philosophy, without guiding principles, without actually creating a clear plan. I used to have this economics teacher, and I want you to think back to school as well. Maybe you had one. I remember this economics teacher. He walked in to the classroom, and the first thing that he wrote on the board, he didn't even tell us his name. We didn't even know who he was. And he turned up, he went inside the classroom, and he wrote on the board, he said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And all of us just burst out laughing. This guy hadn't even told us his name yet. But on the board, he wrote, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And now when I look back at that, and as I grew up and hopefully became a bit more mature than I was in high school, I remember thinking about that statement. I'm thinking, how true is that? that when you're not prepared for something, you miss out on un unbelievable opportunities. Now, I'm not saying good things don't happen spontaneously. Sometimes things happen by chance, randomly, etc., with a reason. But when you're prepared, you can capitalize on things in a huge, huge way. Mark Zuckerberg said it brilliantly at Harvard. He was saying that finding your purpose isn't enough. You have to help other people find theirs. And I know you're passionate about mm -hmm. this. Whatever that definition is, but it has to lead everyone. So if I'm, whether I meet a celebrity, an entrepreneur, or whether I meet somebody starting out, I'm always asking them the question, how can you use what you have to make a difference in the life of other people? Yeah. Because if you start there, everything else will work out. But if you're starting from the point of what am I gonna get, then you're always gonna feel disconnected. Mm. And I see that, I see people who live like that and feel pain in their lives every day, I see that. It's not like some conceptual philosophy. We see it, I see people who are only in it for themselves and they feel disconnected, dissatisfied every single day. And then you see the other extreme where people are just trying to give too much more than they even have themselves and they also feel disconnected. Wow. And again, and they have so, nothing at all. And they have nothing at all, right? So we know, again, <clears throat> attachment and aversion, two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So we wanna be in that dynamic balance of growth, but always to give. Yeah. So I always think, how can I go three steps deeper so that I can move three steps forward so I can give three times as much? Right, it's, or that's always my mentality. How do I go deeper to go more forward to give more? Yeah. And if I can get those three in action for that reason. See, it's all about the reasoning. You can do anything you like, but it's why are you doing it? Yeah, we know of that, course. right? Yeah. It's incredible that we root for underdogs. It's incredible that we want underdogs to win. Why? Because we're used to wanting our team to win. 
We're used to wanting the best to win. We're used to wanting to associate ourselves with people who are successful, right? We never go, oh yeah, I know someone who plays for that really bad team. Like, we don't say that, right? We say things like, oh, I know someone who plays for that really good team. I know someone who was MVP. I know someone who's the son or the daughter of the MVP. We try and associate or link ourselves to success. And when we do that, it in turn makes us feel more successful. It's one of the reasons why when your team wins, you say, we won, right? You say, we won. But when someone asks you, oh, how did your team do? And if they lost that day, you say, they lost. You rarely say, we lost. It's incredible how psychologically we distance ourselves from failure and we closen or liken ourselves to success. But the exception to that rule is the underdog. We all get excited by underdogs. We all get motivated by underdogs. We feel completely enamored by the story of the underdog. Prashant, underdogs are just simple-minded. They don't have expectations and don't have anything to prove to anybody. And Prashant, you've just hit the nail on the head. That's the principle I'm trying to get across. Actually, we should play like champions and train like underdogs. Why? Because the underdog works in a way not worrying about what anybody else thinks or believes. That gives you an edge. It gives you a phenomenal advantage. When you're not actually worried about what will people say, when you're not concerned by, am I going to fail? Am I going to look worse? Is what I'm doing not going to succeed? As an underdog, you don't let those things cloud your mind. You can focus in on the task at hand. See, when we become successful, even as underdogs, if we've risen to success, the biggest enemy of that success, the biggest Achilles heel, the biggest thing that can trip us up is not reconnecting to that feeling of an underdog. So no matter how much success you've achieved, no matter where you are, always remind yourself the mindset of an underdog is the mindset that nurtures talent, that nurtures success, that harnesses your true potential. I'm almost 30 and I don't feel like I've accomplished anything in life. I made a promise to myself while I was at university that I would get a job that excites me every morning. But right now I'm afraid I'm not going in that direction. That note was written by a young person and when I read it, my heart sank. I felt that way because I know so many people that are in that exact position. I remember when I decided to trade my nine to five for a 24 seven, it was because I wanted to do something that was meaningful every day. I wanted to do something that was purposeful and fulfilling from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. The one thing I didn't know before I started is how achievable that was, but also what it required. When I transitioned from my nine to five, or actually my nine to nine to a 24 seven, I realized that I was going to have to work harder, smarter, and faster. And that step was full of fear, full of anxiety, full of insecurity, full of questions like, what will happen if it doesn't work? What will people say? Should I just have stayed where I was? I went through all of those emotions all at the same time, and then something came to me. I wrote down the various options that I had in life at the time, and I wrote a word above them that I believe summarized the experience or the result of what I thought that would give me. Some of them said ego, because I thought those could career paths would give me a boost to my ego. Some said security because there were certain roles or jobs I could take that would provide a certain level of financial security. And then one path said the word love because I knew if I did that, that I would love every moment, even if it was truly challenging and sometimes really difficult to deal with. And that's why I'm here today making this video, speaking to all of you because I chose the path that had the word love above it. Try that exercise, try that activity out to try and differentiate the motive, the intention behind what you're choosing and selecting in life. Now, just because you choose the word love doesn't mean that everything's gonna be smooth sailing and that you're going to be successful. It's going to have its own ups and downs. And that's why wherever you go with your heart, take your head with you. It's always that same question. What's the ROI on social media, right? What's the ROI? Now, the funny thing is, your business work and service, my business work and service literally lives off of social media. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously an ROI. But the problem is we live in a world where we want everything to be measurable. And there's a beautiful Einstein quote that says, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that you can count counts, mm -hmm. right? And we live in this world where everything needs to be measured. Like, oh, that video has a million views. How many sales did you get through that? But it's like life doesn't work like that. There's a lot of adverts and billboards on the street that the biggest brands pay for that don't convert into direct sales. Do you think that Coca-Cola looks at the billboard out there and goes, how many people saw that advert today and how many people bought a Coca-Cola because of that advert? They don't have that number, mm. it doesn't exist. And they're one of the biggest brands in the world, but they still do it.
So social media video is just a new billboard. Mm -hmm. And the biggest brands know that the more you see it, like, I mean, <laughs> this is funny. I saw this today. I saw a big billboard outside of my hotel that has all the Jenners and the Kardashians wearing their Calvins. Have you yeah, seen it? Yeah. Right, I saw it straight away this morning. Then I saw it on Instagram and then I saw it everywhere. So already I've seen it in three places. Now I don't need women's Calvin yeah, yeah, underwear. Yeah. But the point is that I've seen it in a million places. So anyone who's not using video hasn't understood that more people are gonna see video than anything else. And not just that, video is so much better than a billboard. Mm -hmm. You can say so much more. Right. So for me, it's just a lack of seeing opportunity. There's a, there's a great, I think this is a, a old tale, it's not true, but, but it's told that when Nike first went to India, they went there, and it's not Nike, it's any, any sneaker brand, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a nice story. And when they first went to India, they saw everyone was barefoot. <clears throat> So the first reporter came back and said, oh, there's no market there because no one wears trainers. Huh. And then the second reporter went then he said, oh, no one wears shoes. And then he came back and says, we've got a huge market out there. Right? And it's the way you see it. Right, that right, someone right, right. saw no one wearing shoes as no market, but another person saw everyone not wearing shoes as a market. Right. And that's what video is. That you can sit here and debate the ROI on video for as long as you want. But the truth is every major brand has invested in a front window that may not translate to direct sales or work or whatever it is, right. but it does. Do you think every brand should be using video? Every brand should be using video. There's an incredible study in 2017 that said the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, and wise, choose education over entertainment. The impact I wanna have on the world is I wanna transform and revolutionize the entertainment industry so that it becomes educational without anyone knowing. So it's still completely entertaining. It's still like watching Netflix, but you're learning about human behavior, the mind, neuroscience, and everything without even knowing you are. To me, that's the greatest win that we can have for our society. How many people are gonna quit watching Netflix and reading a book every night? I don't know. But if we can make that book come to life on Netflix, that's gonna change the world because that's what people are gonna consume. So for so long, media has been used to numb people, to, to switch people off. If we can use it to excite, elevate, enlighten people, not by just, not by like the cheesy way of like, oh, let's follow someone through their journey of enlightenment. It's not like that kind of stuff. I mean like really entertaining programming where you can learn by being entertained at the same time. If I can do that by changing the, the most powerful industry in the world, then I will feel that I've had some, some what of an impact. Because that way I think we'll reach the world without having to get everyone to change their habits too much. Uh, my, my thing is how do we meet people where they are and, and really deliver a message and a powerful expression of love. And to me that's the highest form of compassion. The highest form of empathy, love and compassion is to meet people where they already are rather than expecting them to change. My daily practice is to refine my intention. The, the biggest weeds that we all get is on our intention. So when I say intention, I mean my current intention is to use everything I've been given, everything that I have in the service of others. So I want to use the following that I have to help people. I want to use the money that I have to help people. I want to use the network that I have to help people. Mm -hmm. But every day that intention, which is a beautiful little plant that's growing, gets weeds around it. No, do it for the money, I hear that voice, right? Uh, do it for the fame. Just do it for the fame, do it for the followers, do it for this, all these weeds are like going around my real uh. intention every day, every day. That's a weed. A weed is the intention that you don't want. And the problem is, sometimes you've let it grow so much, the weed looks like the plant, right? right. The weed looks like your intention, and you start believing it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, my daily practice is going back in, reflecting on what is my voice right now in my head? What am I saying to myself? And I'm hearing, make that deal, it makes a lot of money, do this, do that, do this, more followers, fame, all that stuff, and I'm cutting it down. I'm cutting that weed every day. And you've got to do it every day, because the more you're surrounded by that energy, right. the more it's <clears throat> going to keep creeping in like a creeper weed. At 18, I was really fortunate when I met a monk. And this monk was invited to speak. And I kind of just went because one of my friends forced me to. At that time, I was listening to CEOs and entrepreneurs and business people and marketers who, who I thought that's what I was aspiring to be like. 
And then I hear this monk, and he captivated me like no one had ever captivated me before. It was like staring at the most beautiful woman on the planet. You know, I was completely fixated on him and his message. See, we live in echo chambers. We're just surrounded by the same thinking. How often do you bump into a monk? You know, it just doesn't happen. You don't have, no one has a dinner party and goes, oh yeah, we just invited the monk, you know, from town, like the local monk. Like no one ever does that. And so you, we meet people who are just like us most of the time. And we talk about this in business all the time. If you want to be a billionaire, spend time with billionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, spend time with millionaires. If you want to be a tech startup, spend time with, you know, that's, that's the common rhetoric that we hear all the time. But what if you want to find purpose and master the mind? There's no one better than a monk who's mastered the mind. So, so for me, the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people, so then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. And, and I mean, there's this beautiful quote that I, I've been saying it everywhere, and I wish I wrote it, but I didn't. So it's by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am, I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Right? And just let that blow your mind for a moment. It's, uh, it's so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. Hence, my identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible because maybe that just doesn't fit. And I think so many people feel that way today, that they don't fit into the current education system. They don't fit with the three or four or five careers that you're taught exist. So that process of self-excavation and actualization first requires being exposed. You can't be what you can't see. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one because I wouldn't know what that feels like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it takes. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge of our society, that we're not exposed. So that's the first step, being exposed to unique experiences and role models. Second step is finding that experience or role model that you're passionate about. And exactly like you said, taking it seriously, shadow them, network with them, spend time with them, observe them, even from afar. It takes that observation, being addicted to observing that person's lifestyle. And then the third step is going yes or no. Does that work for me? Not everyone who's going to go off and become a monk is going to feel like the way I did, and that's cool. But not everyone is going to go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. They may want the result, but do they want the hard work that goes with it? And so for me, that's the third step. It's observing, focusing, shadowing, getting as close to the process of that individual, and then going yes or no. Do I want that process? Not do I want the result? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be that monk who's fully enlightened, you know, can walk through, has an incredible aura that people just gravitate towards. But when you realize he has to wake up at 2 a.m. every day and sleeps about four to six hours, you're like, ah, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that. That doesn't sound like me. I'd like you to fast forward to 70, 80, 90 years old, right? Fast forward in your mind to that age, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, if you're really optimistic, whichever one it is. And I'd like you to write down what will be the things that you'll regret that you didn't do. Imagine you're that age, ask yourself the question, what will I regret that I didn't do? Not what you did do, but what you didn't do. Write it down, make a long list right now. Get a pen and paper out and write it down. Don't do it on your phone, don't do it on your laptop. Actually get a pen and paper and write down your answers. What will be the things that you regret that you didn't do, right? Really think about it. Will it be, you know, learning a new language? Will it be moving home? Will it be telling someone you love them? What will it be? What would it have been? Write it down right now. Now, the incredible thing about this question is that you're using the future to empower the past. Whatever answer you have in that qu question, whatever your answer is, you can do it right now, today, starting today, because you're not that age yet. And if you're, even if you're 64 and you're tuning in 70, 80, 90, you're still there, right? It's still possible. You can start doing that right now. It's empowering the present with the future. There is nothing stopping you 
from making it happen right now. You don't have to feel that way when you're 70. You don't have to feel that way when you're 80. You never ever have to feel that way if you start doing it right now. And you can do it right now. Even if it feels impossible, you can start working on it right now. You can start trying right now. You can start making plans right now because you're not there yet. And this is where you start. This is where you start making it happen. It's all in the now. So for me, my three E's are element, environment, and energy. Everyone has an element that they thrive in. If you take someone out of it, their element, they won't be the same. A modern day example would be Michael Jordan. He was incredible at basketball. You took him out of basketball, put him into baseball, no one remembers his career. We're talking about one of the best athletes of all time. Your environment is the environment around you. You can take a fish out of water and give it a beautiful mansion and a Bentley and all the money in the world, but it would die. And that's what we are, like our environment. Everyone needs an environment which they thrive, which we have to craft. Your boss, if you're at work, is never gonna ask you, hey, what, what environment do you succeed in, right? Like, that never happens. So we have to create an environment where we thrive. And then finally, it's energy. We, some of us love high energy environments, high pressure. Some of us succeed in low energy environments and low pressure. Figuring out your energy and the frequency on which you operate best will help you thrive as well. So for me, those are the three E's to really create a thriving environment. Know your element, know your environment, and know your energy. And so at all times, if I see anything going wrong, I'm going, is my element out of alignment? Is my environment out of alignment? Or is my energy out of alignment? And that's a great three question test you can do to yourself when you don't think things are going right. And all you have to do is bring that back into alignment. To remind yourself that it's okay to feel the way you feel when you're going through a difficult time. It's okay to feel weak. It's okay to want to cry. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. Just reminding yourself that it's okay. This is my number one way of how to find strength in difficult times, is reminding yourself that the way you feel is okay to honor that feeling, to accept that feeling, to actually be okay with that, what we see or what we perceive to be a weakness or what we perceive to let us down or what we perceive is a sign of you know, instability or insecurity, we've got to remind ourselves that when things are tough, it's okay to feel that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Any difficulty I go to, I look to moments in history where people have endured the same pain, if not more extreme, and analyze, absorb, and connect with how they got through it. I like to see what they were thinking. I like to see what they did. I like to see how they structured themselves. I like to look at how they organized. I looked, like to look at who they were speaking to. I like to look at what was going through their mind at that time because You've got to remember that any challenge we're facing today, we've faced it before as, a, as humanity, right? Beyond ethnicities, beyond color, race, creed, beyond backgrounds, beyond all walks of life, as human beings, we've been through challenges before and we've got through them. And therefore reconnecting with how that's been done before is a beautiful way of learning how to overcome current challenges. So you can either look at your past, but real wisdom lies in looking at the past of people who made a difference. You look at people like Martin Luther King, you look at people like Gandhi, you look at people who made world-changing differences, not single-handedly, but influenced from a single perspective, from a single point of view, and really connecting with the powerful moments in history. I've said this quote many times, I've read it many times, and this quote actually is, is unbelievable. And the quote says that they thought they buried us, they didn't know we were seeds. Right, it's a Mexican proverb. They thought they buried us, they didn't know we were seeds. And I was thinking, these, when you tell yourself that story, you start thinking much more differently, right? A seed is buried too. It's incredible that the seed goes through the same process as anything else. It's put deep underground, right? All of this mud is put on top of it. It gets rained on, it gets snowed on, all these kind of things, but it knows that it's a seed. So it knows that it can grow, so that anything's possible and it grows through. And you see even plants growing through concrete sometimes, right? It's unbelievable how much power a seed has. So changing the stories we tell ourselves, we can either look at challenging situations as opportunities for growth, as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to change, be the change, or we can look at them and, and really feel down. Now, that, that second part is okay. We can even 
feel like that, right? But we have to recognize it's not permanent. We've got to accept that none of our feelings are permanent. They don't need to be permanent, it's a choice. So if you need to vent, vent. I was saying to someone yesterday, if you need to vent, vent. If you need to rant, rant. If you need to complain, complain. If you need to share how you feel, do that. But recognize that those feelings are not permanent and it will be amazing when we realize we are seeds, right? That is the most powerful way of finding strength. My simple model, which is the Dharma model. It also, Dharma means eternal duty in the Vedic tradition. It's very similar to what Ikigai is being spoken about today, which is the Japanese version of reason for being. Why do we live? Where is meaning coming from? And it talks about an intersect of four areas. What am I good at? What do I love? What does the world need? And how do I get paid for it? To me, those four help you unlock your passion. When you find the intersect across all of those four, you're making your passion your purpose. You'll unlock your passion, you'll find your purpose. This is path one, there's two paths. Path one, I find my skill set and I engage it to help other people and become better at it. So I'm becoming better at what I'm good at and I'm using it to help other people because I'm aware of what I'm quite good at and I know what, what knowledge I have, what skills I have. I have some self-awareness. The other path that people often miss is actually I just start serving people. I just start helping people and I start to notice what I enjoy about that and what I'm good at helping people with. So that's Gandhi's part. Gandhi said that you find yourself when you lose yourself in the service of others. So for me, those are the two paths of how do I find my passion and finding the intersect between those four areas. One of the things that when things don't work out, one of the things I've been telling myself and also thinking about a lot is apart from the fact of learning, which we'll go into, is just that space of actually understanding that there may be a different route. See, we get so attached to having one route, one method, one way of working. We believe that there's only one pathway to where we want to be. There's this conveyor belt of things we have to do, whether it's, you know, get a degree, find a partner, buy a house, you know, play golf, whatever it is, like this conveyor belt of efficiency and productivity that we hear that becomes a part of our natural progression. And when that breaks apart, that's when we start to worry, that's when we start to think. But notice that, that actually it's a lot better when that happens earlier in life. See, regret has some really important roles. The first one is that it helps us make sense of the world from our perspective for one of the first times. See, most of us have spent our lives learning what's important to us based on maybe what families thought, what communities thought, what parents thought, what education taught, whatever it is. When you start regretting something, when you think you did something wrong, when you start thinking that I could have done something differently, you're making sense of the world from your perspective. It's, it's crazy how powerful this is, right? You're starting to make sense of the world from your perspective. The second thing is, it allows you to avoid future negative behavior. If you knew you regretted something, I guarantee you, write it down right now, right? If you regret something, write it down right now because it will teach you so much in the future. And you've got to write down the lesson you learned now. Otherwise, next time when you think you're making another tough decision, you're going to say to yourself, oh, what did I do last time? How did I not make myself regret that? And then you're going to be upset. You're going to regret that you didn't write it down. So write it down right now. Life for me is a life, and this applies to a company, an organization, an institution for me, is an ideal life is when we all have a head, a heart, and a hand, all three elements together, working in alignment. Without one or the other, we start to lose something. If you only have a head and a heart, you'll find that life is stable. And defined yeah, to Yeah, sure, 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 sure. So a head is the clarity of vision. What you want. What you want, knowing what you want the way you picture life and being able to navigate and make the decisions to get there. That's a good head. A good heart is being able to understand what your intuition and heart wants, being able to connect and tap into that understanding deeper and beyond the vision you may have painted for yourself. So I often say to people that you'll get to where you want in life, just not in the way you imagined. And that's because the path that's paved up and down is far different to the path we pave. So you can have a great head and a great vision and a great mission and know where you want to go, but if your heart's not able to have that resilience and be able to adapt and, and have compassion and care and all of that, then, then you're not going to be able to make the toughest decisions without your heart. But to be able to realize that we need to 
care and be sustainable and long-lasting requires a heart. And a hand is that service, wanting to pass that on, that which you have, wanting to give it forward, pay it forward. The idea of serving with what you have. I often say to people, your passion is for you, your purpose is for others. Your passion makes you happy, but when you use your passion to make a difference in someone else's life, that's a service, that's a purpose, mm -hmm. and that's the hand. Oh, so right. those are my three elements of an ideal life.